I know, I know you wanted to do that, see? That's why I did that. He's cute. But the one thing I noticed about him right off, this is Pikachu, one thing I noticed about him right off was his tail. It's a lightning bolt. And it's a satanic Z. It even comes down here to a point. Now, just by looking at him enough, alone is not enough to really be able to say, okay, yeah, that's bad, or that's satanic. What we first need to do is we need to look at the actual production of these things. And the first thing we need to do is we need to look at who actually produced the trading card game that has captured the minds and the imaginations of our children. Now, it doesn't make any difference what I say, it's what their own material says, because their own material will give them away. Okay? So I'm going to read to you, here's a direct quote from the, the web pages of the producer of this game. Listen to this. The Pokemon trading card game is a new collectible card game that is made and distributed by Wizards of the Coast. What is a wizard? Male practitioner of black magic. Wizards of the Coast. The same company that made the best-selling game, Magic the Gathering. Magic the Gathering is a heavily occult-laced trading card game which has been very popular in the 90s. And I should also tell you that Wizards of the Coast also owns a subsidiary company named TSR. And TSR is the company that puts out all Dungeons and Dragons material. So let's look at Magic the Gathering because this is the same company that puts out Pokemon. So let's see where they're coming from. Now, from seeing the symbols, your, your actual discernments have now begin to be sharpened. How many see a circle? How many see a pentagram? Yeah. If you look, there it is. See that? Magic the Gathering. This is a role-playing game. Now, parents, in case you don't know what that is, that means that your child actually becomes a character in the game. Actually becomes a part of the game. And that's what makes it exciting is there's not many games out there that they can actually become a part of. They can play it, but they don't actually become a part of it. In this particular game, they actually do become a character in the game. And remember it said that it's an occult game. One of the dangers of this thing is, being a role-playing game, is that it's played with the mind. How many know that the mind is a very fragile thing? And what happens is, in these role-playing games, I'm going to use the example of Dungeons & Dragons, because TSR is the one that puts out all their material. The danger of Dragons, Dungeons & Dragons, or any kind of role-playing game like this, is that it's played with the mind, and when played with the mind, the mind begins to lose that fine line with what's real and what's fantasy. And the more you get into the fantasy world, the more it seems real, and all of a sudden now you don't know what's real and what's not. In Dungeons and Dragons, this is a game played by three or four people. And what you do is you have one particular person that's the dungeon master, and he sets all the rules up for this thing. And then in your mind, you actually fight battles. You go through mazes, you go through dungeons, and you actually fight wars with evil wizards, dragons, demons, powerful satanic beings. It's all in the mind. And I mean, if you've got a vivid imagination, you can have one next to you. And what happens is, is that you can play this game for 10 to 12 years. Because the object is, as long as your character is alive, you're in the game. Once your character dies or gets killed in that particular game, you're out. So you can imagine that if a person loses touch with reality and now they've actually become that character, guess what? Anything that happens to that character now happens to them. And there's overwhelming evidence, psychiatrists and psychologists both tell us, there's overwhelming evidence showing that a lot of teenage suicides that are caused by Dungeons and Dragons are caused because the player has finally lost touch with reality. And what's happened to them now, they actually feel a psychic bond with that character. And so the character gets killed off, no longer in the game. You have no, no purpose, because all your purpose was for the last 10 to 12 years was playing Dungeons and Dragons. So your 
character gets knocked off, guess what? So let's go back to Magic the Gathering. Here's one of the cards. Yeah, isn't he cute? This is Cabal Ghoul. Now, you notice that there's counters up here. In other words, this stands for two points. And it says Cabal Ghoul. Now, if, in case you don't know what a ghoul is, it's a dead, rotting, decaying thing that's been in the ground and magically summoned back to life. So you have a walking dead thing. And that's what a ghoul is. And in this particular thing, it says, at the end of each turn, put a one plus one counter on Cabal Ghoul for each other creature that died during the turn and was not regenerated. In other words, you have cards that will actually keep your character alive for a certain amount of time. Here's another interesting card. Because it's called the All Hallows Eve card. Again, this is all in magic. Magic together. By the way, there was a news clip that I read about two weeks ago that spoke of a young boy in Maine. I don't remember what the town was, but he was in Maine. And he came home one day and asked his mother about Magic the Gathering and said that the teacher had decided to use Magic the Gathering, this card game, as a new and exciting way to teach mathematics in, in school, in their class. And they even formed what was called a magic club, and that all the kids were part of this magic club. Well, the mother said, well, you're not going to become a part of that. You're not going to be in that. But one of the kids had given him one of the cards, and that card he showed to his mother, and that card was called Necromancer. And on that card, it showed spiritual beings actually being risen up out of the ground, out of their grave. And then he asked his mother, what does summon mean? And she said, why do you ask that? And she said, he told her, he said, because all the kids on recess go outside on the school grounds, pick up huge sticks, wave them in the air, and say, spirits and energy. All Hallows Eve, again two points symbolized by two souls. Here's your demonic black cat. I guess it's a black cat. There's your demon in the middle. Jack o' lantern, full moon. And it says this card is called sorcery. Sorcery comes from the Greek word pharmakeia. That's where we get the word pharmaceutical. In occultism, it's witchcraft and drugs. Sorcery. And it says put two counters on this card. Remove a counter during your upkeep. When you remove the last counter from All Hallows Eve, all players take all creatures from their graveyards and put them directly wow. into play. Treat these creatures as though they were just summoned. But I want to know you choose sure. what order they come to play. Remember, again, wow. this is a role-playing game. I love you. But I want to know This is called sure. the magician. I wonder why. Here you see the man kneeling, and look, he's forming with his hands the triangle. Right there. He's kneeling in front of a flame. There are the crescent moons behind him. Over here can only be demons. Hellfire all around here. It's called the magician. And these are collectible cards. And these are cards that one day your child may come home. Or may know of a student that has given you some of these cards. Now you will know what they are. So let's go back to Pokemon. Because now we've already established that the same company that puts out that game and puts out Dungeons and Dragons puts out a cute little Pokemon. Isn't that interesting? Now, before we go any further, I want to see that if we as a group can agree on something. So I need a little audience participation here to say yes or no. Okay? We are you into that? Okay. Listen to me carefully. If we examine the characters, this particular program and they are the kind of role models that we want our kids to be watching in other words if, if this whole game the characters of this game the monsters this whole premise of this thing actually goes to establish the kind of values the kind of standards and the kind of morals that we want our kids to have when they reach adulthood that it's okay in other words if they actually help to establish the kind of morals, values, and standards that we want our children or our grandchildren to have when they get to be an adult, that it must be all right. Can we agree on that? 
Okay, so what we need to do is we need to examine and see what kind of role models we have in this game. Now, what we need to do then, everybody go all again. Oh, I know, he's cute. Up here is the Pokemon Ball. Okay, that's this thing here. Okay, and inside of that, you catch the Pokemon. That's the Pokemon Ball, and you actually catch the monster inside of that thing and harness the power in there. And then you can call on that power to regenerate itself outside of that ball. And praise God, it turns into a bigger and better monster. Now, we're told that there are 150 species of these particular creatures on the face of the earth. And we're also told in the material that these pocket monsters are creatures that inhabit the world with humans. And that they can evolve and grow in bigger and better creatures. Now, the object of this game is got to catch them all. And they tell you that if you catch them all, you become a Pokemon master. Listen, parents, that word master will appeal to any child because they can become a somebody. They can become a master. And you know what? If you're the master of something, you don't need mom, you don't need dad, you don't need grandparents, you don't need aunts and uncles, you don't need school, and you probably don't even need because you're a master. You can become a god. That's the premise of what this has been. You become the Pokemon master. That's the whole premise and the whole goal of this game. Now, this is the main character right here. He's called Ash Ketchum. Not Hal Ketchum, but Ash Ketchum. And I'm, again, it doesn't make any difference what I say, it's what their own material says. I'm going to tell you what, what they describe it as. Listen to this. An energetic and determined 10-year-old who's a little too competitive, and he's obsessed with catching all Pokemon and driven to become the world's foremost Pokemon master. And, you know, every time your children watch this program, whether it's a video, whether it's a cartoon, whether it's a comic book, no matter what it is, they hear this mantra, this rap song, is played over again. And it says, I will travel across the land searching far and wide each Pokemon to understand the power that's inside. And then it's enchanted to them. Gotta catch them all. Over and over and over and over again. You know what it does? It fuels your child's craving for more cards, more books, more videos, more movies. It's designed to do that. And that's what we call enchanting. Here's the next character. This is Misty. Look at this. Now this is off of a comic book. This is actually a Facebook comic book. But if this was clear, if this was actually clear, you'd see that that's a halter comic. She stops right there. And she's got short shorts on. You know she's got to be about the same age as what Ash is. Okay. And she's described as Ash's companion. Now listen to what he says about her. She's headstrong and stubborn, constantly arguing with Ash. She's a woman. No, just kidding. Just kidding. God forgive me. All right. Frivolous spirit. That's the one. And here's Brock over here in the corner. And Brock is by far the most hormonal because his fascination with the opposite sex many times gets him or the group in trouble. Well, then there's Pokemon trainer Gary. Gary's not pictured. Yet. But Gary is a real self-centered jerk. He's vindictive and he's obnoxious. Then there are two characters, and one's called Jesse, and the other one's called James. Listen to what it says about them. It says, prepare for trouble, make it double. Jesse and James are an evil game, looking to steal rare Pokemon. Jesse and James are stuck up, fashion conscious. And you know what? In the program, they're also prone to cross-dressing. Now, if you don't know what that means, that means that if you feel like you're a woman in a man's body, you dress like that. If you're a woman who feels manly, you wear man's underclothing and dress like that. Cross-dressing. Oh, what kind of role model would that be? 
Okay, now remember at the first, I think that's enough right here. Because I think we've got a pretty well good establishment on this one. Remember that I said that if the characters were the kind of role models that established the kind of values, standards, and morals that we wanted our kids to have when they got to be an adult, that this game or this particular thing is okay. Remember we said that? Okay, so let's examine what we got. Let's see. Uh, headstrong, stubborn, quibbling, self-centered, vindictive, obnoxious, hormonal, sexually preoccupied, evil, thieving, cross-dressing jerks. I don't know about you, but I mean, even if I wasn't a Christian parent, I wouldn't want my kids to grow up those kind of grades. Then we have to actually say that the characters of this game don't biblically stand up, do they? In other words, they don't represent the kind of values and standards of our kids. And they're definitely not the role models of our kids. But these are the characters that our children are identifying day after day after day playing this game, watching the cartoon, reading the books, looking at the videos. Now we're also told that these actual beings have supernatural abilities. In other words, they can evolve and grow into bigger and better monsters. Take control. Now this is a scene, right actually this is a poster from the movie. Free and look here, this is Mewtwo, this is Mew over here, M-E-U. He's kind of cute. And this is Mewtwo over here, complete with his satanic salute. And if you notice, that pose is always given with the left hand. That's significant. Remember the left hand pass? Right and we're told that they get bigger and better. Of course, that's what we always want. Bigger and better monsters, that's what the world needs. And we're told that they get bigger and better through the use of energy. Now, a funny thing happened, it actually wasn't funny, but an interesting thing happened. When this movie, Pokemon, was actually first released in Japan, I want you to see it. This is from CNN. Look at this. Because this is very highly unusual. Japanese cartoon triggers seizures in hundreds of children. And look at this. This is Tokyo, December 17, 1997. This is when the movie was first actually released over in Japan. The bright flashing lights of the popular TV cartoon became a serious matter to the evening when they triggered seizures in hundreds of Japanese children. In a national survey, the Tokyo Fire Department found that at least 618 children had suffered convulsions, vomiting, irritated eyes, and other symptoms after watching Pokemon. Japanese television network NHK reported that 111 people were still hospitalized Wednesday morning. And now spokesman Hiroshi Uramoto said that a later broadcast of the show scheduled for 30 other stations nationwide had been canceled and that an investigation was well underway. We are shocked to hear many children were taken to hospital, Uramoto said. We will investigate thoroughly and consult with experts. You know what they found? Not one of those children had a history of epilepsy. Now, you know, working in the mental health field for as long as I did, I can tell you that bright flashing lights will trigger off in several, uh, in occasion, seizures and convulsions in kids or even adults that are prone to be epileptic. But not in a hundred and so kids who have no seizure problem and no epileptic history. There's something unusual about that. And they went through, and it goes on further to say that they went through and even did CAT scans. And the whole premise was that at the end, they had to conclude that they don't know why it happened. Is that by coincidence? Or did something happen that they can't explain? Remember I said that they get their energy through energy balls. And here is a picture of little cute little Pikachu and he's being energized by an energy ball. And now you notice he's not quite so cute anymore and his little satanic tail is really erect. And now parents, if you're not up on Pokemon, you need to be. And one of the things you can do is go out and buy the official Pokemon trading card game player's guide. And you can get this at any store that sells any of the Pokemon stuff. I mean anything. 
Uh, it, you can get it like at uh, uh, Toys R Us or any of those places that sell any of the Pokemon. And it says on the back of this, catch them all, then build an un unbeatable tournament deck. And one of the things you can do is look through here because it shows every Pokemon in existence. And it tells you what their powers are. And it tells you how they get weak. And it tells you how they energize and what you need to energize them. But something very unusual is also in this book. And that is that they actually show the energy balls that is used to make these monsters bigger and better. I want you to see them. I hope you can see them from where, where I am. Um, I'm going to hold it out here so hopefully you can see it. Look at the yellow. What do you see? Lightning bolt. Look here. All seeing eye. Everybody see that? Up here is the clenched fist. Symbol for rebellion, anarchy. Right down here is a powerful witchcraft symbol where my finger is. Powerful witchcraft symbol, and it's a symbol for fire. Down here is another powerful witchcraft symbol, actually a new age symbol they call new age symbol for earth. Okay, which is a green leaf. And down at the bottom here, this blue ball down in here, is the symbol for energy of water. And water transforms into wind. Earth, wind, and fire, the three basic elements of all they put that in there by coincidence? Do you think they just built this game, put these on there and said, hey, let's just put those symbols on there. They look cool. Kids won't know what they are, but they'll like them because they look cool. Or did they put them on there because they know what the meaning of each one of those symbols is? And they wanted to sensitize our children to seeing those symbols so much that when they see them in other things, hey, no big deal. There is the biased plan going on for the battle of our children's minds. There's a war going on right now for the children because Satan wants them really bad. Who better to serve the enemy than the youth? And the whole object is to catch them while they're young. Remember the old, remember the, the Pokemon motto? Gotta catch them all. Who do you think feels that way? It's the enemy. Gotta catch them all.